Well, good evening, everyone, uh, and good day to those of you who are joining from outside of the Africa region. Uh, we are incredibly happy to be coming to you as a team, the One Health Workforce Next Generation team, uh, on behalf of myself and the co-director, uh, Professor Vautrina Smith, we want to welcome you. Um, we also would like to, as always, thank the U.S. Agency for International Development for their amazing support, allowing us to build this community of practice and coming together um, to discuss critical COVID issues uh, for the region and the world. Um, we recognize that all of you who are joining us today are leaders in your communities, leaders in your academic institutions, leaders in your field. And we appreciate the opportunity to be together, talk together, work through these uh, difficult issues and difficult times. Uh, today we have some amazing speakers uh, and they are uh, going to share their thoughts with you and then we'll have an opportunity to have questions. Um, please do put questions in the chat box as we go um, and I will um, have some other updates for you from our wonderful partner, um, Dr. Bruce Strominger, who leads uh, the ECHO platform. But before I do that, I think it's um, a time to reflect. We've all been living with uh, COVID-19 now for a few months, and uh, it's been a very difficult time. It's been a very chaotic time, and I think now we're starting to settle into what will be our new normal, at least until we can protect um, the global population with uh, vaccines and have better therapeutics available to us. And some of your speakers today will really um, bring you that, that update and hopefully the hope that we will be um, finding the light at the end of this tunnel. But until then, I think we have to remember that we are all the leaders in this arena and we need to be thoughtfully considered, considering and putting forward messages of both hope, but also safety. Uh, yesterday, one of our uh, speakers, or actually for you this morning, one of our speakers from Southeast Asia had a beautiful message for us. And she said, your frontline healthcare workers are not uh, the um, first defense. Your immune system is the first defense. And you need to take care of yourselves, protect yourselves and protect others. And so as we think about um, moving back into society, getting our critical economies going, reducing the impacts of the stress of isolation, um, we still need to be able to be careful and protect ourselves. So we can get things moving and the, some of the best models are showing that as we get things moving, we can um, still protect ourselves from more cases and more deaths. But if we change our behavior rapidly while we're opening up and see a signal um, of opening up to mean that we can be close to each other, do what we all want to do, hug each other, um, and um, be together in large groups, um, that that can be very dangerous without masks and hand washing. Um, and distancing, uh, if we change that behavior and start really loosening up our personal behavior, we could see a dramatic increase uh, in cases and deaths. So, so we need to protect from that. Um, so uh, I think we can look forward to the amazing advances that are going to help us with that and then use our own best practices and speak to our communities about best practices um, while we, uh, we wait and hope and um, some of us uh, endeavor to make those things uh, come to reality. So with that, let me hand it over to uh, Dr. Bruce to uh, explain uh, the wonderful platform that we're using, ECHO, and how we can make the most of it. Uh, and, um, and I just want to thank Project ECHO again for their wonderful um, support and membership and partnership in, in the One Health Workforce. Great, thank you, Jana. And again, welcome to everyone who's joining us today uh, to participate in this learning community. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see the, the agenda there. And just a few housekeeping items. We're, this is our sixth 
uh, coming together as a community of practice to uh, learn about COVID-19 and, and the One Health perspective. And one thing that really helps us to get to know each other is if you have the bandwidth, please turn your camera on so that we can see each other. Many of us have met before, but many of us have not. So this really helps us to, to get to know each other more quickly and, and, and to build this community of practice. Having said, turn on your camera, I'm going to ask that if you're not speaking, if you're not wanting to make a comment or, or pose a question, please keep your microphone muted so that we can hear the speaker clearly. If you can please rename yourself, they're, they're up in your Hollywood Square, there are three Android. There you go. So uh, speaking of muting your microphone, uh, there, there you go. So anyway, if you can rename yourself with your name and your organization, that also helps us know where you are and what organization you're with as we build this community of practice. If you have technical issues, please chat Echo IT. If you have issues with Zoom and we'll try to help you. In the chat function, generally, please put your questions and comments related to today's program. We don't need you to put your, your name in attendance. Uh, we'll be tracking that other ways. One of the ways we're tracking uh, attendance is use of the PDA participant app. Hopefully many of you have downloaded that. We'll share instructions okay. in the chat for doing that. Let me take you from School of Nursing, Lutz, Nigeria. And let me just, for Yuta, if you can handle that. Thank you. Um, the QR code to the right for those who are using the PDA app, uh, if you can scan that, and then we'll be putting up an end QR code. And uh, you will then get an attestation of your participation and you'll get instant access to the PowerPoints uh, for today. But for everyone else, the presentation slides will be shared also by email after the session. They will also be available on the One Health uh, website for UC Davis. And uh, we'll be sharing links to all that uh, in the chat. The session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded, so thank you for that. We will also be offering continuing professional development credits. They're through the University of New Mexico where the ECHO Institute is based. And we will share a link in the chat toward the end of the session. You will complete a short survey and that's how we get feedback from you, which we value tremendously because that's how we uh, take your input into account to keep improving these sessions. So please take advantage of that. There's also a social media guide for, for all those who are Twittering and using Facebook and other types of Instagram, et cetera. And we've got some ideas for you to help you with that. For those who are Francophone, uh, there is uh, an interpretation button in the bottom line of the Zoom screen. And so if you go there and you click on French, you will be hearing uh, French interpretation. So let us know if you have any trouble with that, but it, it appeared to be working well just a moment ago. So with that, I am going to hand the microphone over or back to Jana to introduce Dean Bezeo. Yes, so now I have the honor of introducing you to our fearless leader for the Africa One Health University network and our um, strong, strong partner for the region and the world. Uh, it's my honor to be a team member with Dean William Bazeo, who will give us words of wisdom and his welcoming remarks. Thank you, Jonah. And I wish to welcome all the participants. I can see we have now reached 130. This is very encouraging. But I also want to note that, as Jonah said from the beginning, we have been going through this with the disease for some months. We have built some resilience in, the, in some countries and in some communities. Uh, we believe that where we have reached 
we have made progress. I'd like to thank all of you for standing with your communities, with your institutions, to help each other to make sure that we are on the right track. I think I don't want to blow the trumpet early. I think we would be happy as I was listening this morning on the radio. Somebody said we can we can celebrate the end of the first wave. But now, as we are speaking, and as Jonah said, our best defense is immunity, the immune system. Because if we are looking at what is going to come next, we don't know. But we need to create an opportunity to build immunity within ourselves, within the community. And I want to thank our partners, Jonah and the, her team in the US, to see that they have stood with us in Africa and Asia, because we keep looking forward to this. I can, I can tell you that many people keep looking to this discussion every two weeks, looking forward to hearing new things, hearing from each other, how are people coping? Uh, I'd like to add to her voice to welcome our speakers. I know that the Professor Roda is very busy, as I said, some of you had. She's on the National Task Force. They have been working day and night, and I notice she's still in the office. Curfew is in about two, uh, two hours' time. I'm sure it will find her there. She will find her way through curfew, but don't ask her how she will travel. Those are the guys who are on the front line, so they must be given way to, to go back to their homes after midnight. But I want to welcome her as she shares the experience and what we have built in, in Uganda. I think she's the right person to come on the stage and tell the whole world how far we have gone. I'd like to welcome our other speaker. I know that there are always challenges of uh, internet, but having accepted, we hope that we'll hear what is happening on that side. Now, I have one question, and I hope many of us can think about it. We have been talking about social distancing. We are dealing with communities. We have these communities that we have started seeing in these uh, demonstrations like Hong Kong, a few hours ago, like the US, and some other countries that we have seen uh, demonstrations. As scientists, what do we have to offer to them? At this time, prepare them as we are talking about building immunity within ourselves and the community. With those few words, I'd like once again to welcome you, welcome all the participants, and hand over to Jonah and Bruce so that we start the session. Thank you once again. To you, our fabulous Dr. Brian Bird, um, to, to take us through to the program. All right, well, thank you everyone. I'm so glad you're here again for our sixth ECHO session uh, for the One Health Workforce Next Generation. Uh, just to think about what where we've come from since we've started. We've talked about the One Health aspects, you know, where coronaviruses come from, uh, excellent talks in that first session. Then we talked about community surveillance-based techniques of how we could find out who's infected in our communities and what we can do about that gender and psychosocial issues, which are obviously critical in every outbreak. We have to take care of those that have been infected so that they're not stigmatized in their communities. Then we had a session on what's working and what's not, just general perspectives and things and ideas from people, you, you the participants there listening in, and all these faces that I see here across uh, Africa and the world that have dialed in. And we talked about diagnostics, and now we turn to immunity and uh, interventions. And 
Uh, interventions come in several flavors. Some of those are non-pharmaceutical, so the things we can do ourselves, basic hygiene and social distancing, and then the medical uh, interventions like vaccines and therapeutic drugs and the like. So let me start my share screen and we'll talk about the global updates uh, that have come out in the last two weeks since we last chatted. So as I said, this session's on immunity and interventions for COVID-19 and SARS coronavirus 2. And when we think about interventions, the whole point of an intervention is to stop the chain of transmission, right? Uh, we know from other outbreaks that occur that we've all participated in or have been aware of, things, you know, the Ebola's and loss of fevers and the like. Uh, when a person is infected, that virus is then transmitted in these chains of human to human transmission, whether the virus started in humans or started in wildlife, like the SARS coronavirus 2. And then my little section is going to be focused on this middle panel of this chart here, talking about the non pharmaceutical interventions, the, the hygiene, social distancing, because while we need to build immunity in our populations, we can also interrupt and stop the chain of transmission simply by increasing our physical distances and washing hands and things of that nature. And then finally, the last panel down there is about immunization. And that's how you truly build massive herd immunity and can interrupt the chain of transmission because the virus or the pathogen has nowhere to go. Everyone in the community is immune. So the global situation update uh, since we last spoke we're now at about 6.2 million cases uh, and virtually every country in the world have, has reported uh, cases. And that's 1.5 million more than the last time we chatted two weeks ago. And if you remember two weeks before that, it was a million more. And two weeks before that, it was also a million more. So we're at this rate of increase of cases of at least a million to a million and a half people every two weeks. Across our Afrohoon, uh, uh partner countries. Uh, there's now a, about 18,000, almost 19,000 reported lab confirmed cases. And that's actually double from the last two weeks. So please, please keep in your mind that the outbreak is, while we're in a new normal, we're adjusting to the situation that is the outbreak and the pandemic in our minds, the outbreak is real. It's still there. It's the virus is still spreading and causing great harm in our communities, right? And just two days ago, uh, a large meta-analysis, so this is an analysis of many different studies that have looked at how effective are, is physical distancing and hand washing and the masks and the like, are those effective or not? And a large analysis came out in the Lancet uh, just two days ago. And I'm gonna talk about that for just a few minutes. So this paper by Chu et al, and the link for that is down here in the lower right. If you click that, you'll get a PDF or a link to the PDF for that um, uh, article. And this study looked at over 25,000 patients. Uh, these were patients that were either infected with SARS-1, you know, classic SARS, 2003 outbreak, uh, MERS coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, and now SARS-2 or COVID-19. And what they found, and you can see some of the data just from this table that I copied into my slide on the right here in pink, uh, that things like physical distancing, face mask, uh, and eye protection are quite effective in reducing transmission, either in healthcare settings, which completely makes sense, your intensity of contact with patients is higher in a healthcare setting, but also in the communities. And that's the, one of the nice things about this analysis. Uh, they showed that as you increase physical distancing between people, there is a reduction in new cases. And also face masks are, are quite effective, much more so than I would have thought personally uh, with my uh, background in uh, biosecurity. And it could be N95 respirators, which of course are the gold standard. Those are the best uh, to protect both ourselves and others, but also masks like this one, like many of us wear. These kind of masks, like I wear when I go to my grocery store, when I go for food, or I go out in public. So these kinds of masks are also effective because they help prevent the spread of virus from me if I was an asymptomatic case. So I'm infected, but I'm not sick, but I can spread the virus. These can help block the transmission of that virus on. They're not perfect. This is just a piece of cloth, you know but they can be effective on a population basis. So 
These basic principles of hygiene and infection prevention control are key. We know that from Ebola, we know that from loss of fever, we know that from many other outbreaks. So please, please keep those thoughts in mind and follow those practices. So here's just uh, a few more links to these kind of things. This is a nice uh, infographic, I think, from Africa CDC and the Africa Union. There are excellent resources on that website uh, that are uh, appropriate for uh, settings in your countries. So check these links out here on the left. Uh, and here's a guide for those of you that work in healthcare settings or are involved in more uh, uh, broader uh, settings where people come together, like in universities and other places, uh, these, these manuals and guides. And the links are here, and they should be active. So if you download my slides and click the links, they should, should take you straight there. And there are lots of videos and things on the WHO website that explain in more detail all of these uh, uh, activities. And just the last slide, as always, is a link or links to other important information that will be factual and is vetted by worldwide experts. If you're looking for uh, information on animal spillover, other coronavirus resources, and the global tracker uh, uh, um, tools. So with that, I'm gonna stop my share screen, and I'm gonna invite our first speaker, who I'm very delighted to have with us. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mike Wieland. So he's a program manager with the, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and CEPI has done an amazing job in the last several years of really invigorating and changing how we think about how vaccines are developed and promoted and then used out in the population. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Whelan and he can give us his updates from CEPI. Over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Brian. Sorry, I was just having trouble unmuting myself. Um, well, it, it's a real honor to get a chance to talk to you all today. So what I wanted to do was really give you an idea of who we are at CEPI and what we we're trying to do, because things have changed. You may have heard of us in the past, and what we're doing now has changed somewhat. So if we jump right into it, CEPI is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. We were actually set up as a direct result of what happened in the Ebola outbreak of 2014 to 2016 the world said this should never happen again and they were right um, but we knew it was going to happen again and as the current events have laid out that's exactly what happened but we were funded we were set up initially in davos at the world economic forum in january 2017 and it was really it was a number of people people like bill gates and their and this foundation the welcome trust the sovereign wealth fund of norway they put a lot of money together and actually created the entity that is CEPI. Um, our aim is to finance, stimulate and develop vaccines for diseases which have largely unmet need, but also have the possibility to become epidemics. And sure enough, that's what happened. So our rather lofty goal is to develop a world in which epidemics are no longer a threat to humanity. It's a very big aim, but you've got to shoot for the stars. And so how were we going to do that? So what we wanted to do was accelerate the development of these vaccines, but also to ensure, and it's really important to us, that there is equitable access of these vaccines. It's no good just developing these for use in the West when, in fact, that's not where they're needed. So we want to be prepared. And this really speaks to, well, I'll explain how this works in a second, but it really speaks to an outbreak of a disease that we already know about. We also want to be able to respond, and that's exactly what we have been doing for the last six months. But we also want to ensure that these things are sustainable. They have to be available where they're needed, when they are needed, regardless of the ability to pay. So when we started, and I joined in 2018, and we launched our first call for proposals, that's what CFP stands for. And our first call for proposals were three diseases with known epidemic potential and which largely have been ignored. Probably the lead one is actually Lassa fever, and that's where you may well have heard of CEPI, because certainly we've done a lot 
in uh, West Africa on um, LASA projects. And we've actually got four or five running at the moment. But we also had NEPA, which there was a large outbreak in Kerala province a couple of years ago, which was everybody died. It was it's a terrible disease. And of course, there was MERS, which is a coronavirus. So did we expect it was going to be a coronavirus? Yes, we probably did. We then had a second call for proposals, and this is where I had the pleasure of meeting Brian because we worked together on one of the Rift Valley Fever projects. And we also decided to do something on chikungunya as well. And our third arm has been this reactive use. And I'll come back to this, but this was Disease X. We didn't know what it was going to be, but we wanted to have platforms ready which could be deployed in an emergency. And guess what? We did. So up until about December, our portfolio looked a bit like this. And as you can see, we have a large number of projects. And basically, we will take them towards the end of a phase two study and then create a stockpile. That stockpile could be used in an emergency. And in fact, that's what happened, say, with Ebola. We know recently the vaccine was licensed, but actually it never went through a formal licensure procedure because in an emergency, you could argue you probably don't need it because these are relatively small outbreaks where we could react very quickly. That's not the case for COVID-19. You can see we have a large variety of different partners and technologies, and we are somewhat agnostic about vaccines. So long as they work and they're safe, we are interested. We don't like to say one particular technology is better than another. We want several shots on goal because not all of these are going to succeed for various reasons. So for example, we've got recombinant proteins, we've got recombinant viruses, we've got DNA, we've got RNA, we've got inactivated viruses, pretty much every type of vaccine platform you can think of, we've got. And at the bottom of this slide, you'll see we've got three technologies, and I'll come back to that in just one second. Now, it's also very important to note that obviously we've got the standard development of any vaccine from preclinical, phase one, phase two, and then a phase three licensure trial. But alongside those, there's a lot of enabling sciences, and these are really critically important because it's all very well having these things going on, but if we don't know, we've got no way of comparing them, it's pointless. So things like assays and standards, we need an international standard for each of our diseases. And in fact, we've already done one for Lassa fever, and that was released. There's an interim standard, which has actually been released to our developers already, and that will go for um, WHO accreditation in November this year. So that will be a standard that if your vaccine hits that, you know it works. But these didn't exist. Similarly, we developed new animal models. We had to develop epidemiology. If we wanted to do a phase three trial, where are we gonna do it? Without epidemiology, we don't know. We needed new diagnostics. And of course, we needed regulatory compliance because a lot of these diseases will be almost impossible to take through a standard registration trial. So do, do we use the animal rule? Do we use emergency use? So we've got constant interaction with regulators as we go on. Anyway, our portfolio up until December looked a bit like this. So we had vaccines, both prophylactic and responsive. We had the idea of storing these as a phase two stockpile, which could be used in an emergency. And we've done all of this cross-cutting. But that was then, this is now. The, Ebola, uh, the uh, COVID outbreak started, as we know, in late December, and we started reacting in January. COVID is different. It doesn't discriminate between rich and poor countries. The vaccine is needed by everyone. So a phase two stockpile, which would be used under a clinical trial, is not appropriate. We need licensed vaccines, which meant we had to change our model quite substantially. So what did we do? First of all, I told you already, we have these vaccine platforms. We turned them on. We 
uh, for example, I've got a project in Queensland, which I'll show you in a second. We moved them over from MERS in early January, and they had a vaccine candidate ready for us first week of February. We also issued a new call for proposals, and we turned that round in less than 10 days. And we actually have 10 live vaccine projects running for COVID-19 currently, and there will be more. Very high level engagement with WHO and other NGOs, people like the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust have been fantastic. And we've also issued calls for further funds. We th we've actually issued a call for another $2 billion, most of which we have got, which we will spend purely on this. And of course, we had to start enabling sciences, and I'll come back to that. So we are seeking to manufacture and license three to four new vaccines for COVID because simply one is not gonna be enough. This is just an example of some of the, the rapid response technologies. This is the group in Australia I told you about, and it uses a technology called molecular clamp. It's very good for type one and type three glycoproteins because the insertion protein of most of these viruses is metastable. So it's very difficult to make an antibody response to it because it keeps moving about. The molecular clamp holds it in that position and you can make an antibody to it. Once a virus inserts into a cell, it changes conformation. And you can easily make antibodies to it, but that's too late, you've already been infected. We want the other one. And that's what this technology does. We had been using this for flu, RSV and MERS. And as I said, we were able to turn this over to COVID-19 in the space of about a week. Similarly, our, our colleague, colleagues at Imperial College London, this is Professor Robin Shattuck, he's got a self-amplifying self RNA technology. He has been funded partly through us and partly through the UK government to develop a new COVID-19 vaccine, and that should be entering into trials in the next couple of weeks. And the third technology platform we already had was our friends in Germany, CureVac, who are a straight RNA play vaccine. And again, they managed to get up and running very quickly. They've completed all their preclinical testing and they should be in clinical trial imminently, like possibly within the next two weeks. I also mentioned enabling sciences. So these are the things that we didn't have. This was a new disease. There were no animal models. There were no standards. There was no centralized tech, nothing. So we had to fund that first. So for example, if we look at the animal models, there simply wasn't one. But we managed to help fund the development of these very rapidly with our colleagues at WHO. Initially, this was the ACE2 transgenic mice. ACE2, as you probably know, is the receptor for COVID-19. So there, there are actually a couple of different versions of these mice. The best one is actually has the mouse ACE2 promoter and the human ACE2 gene in it. But there's not very many of them, they're quite rare, and to get enough to test a number of vaccines is almost impossible. So we also developed a number of different systems, and one of the leading ones is the ferret model, a bit like flu, although it's slightly, it's a much deeper lung infection. It does show lung pathology, and it does show virus shedding. We've managed to help co-fund some of the non-human primate work. Rhesus macaques seem to be about the best, the cyanomolgus monkeys do work, and there is some work in African green monkeys, though we haven't seen it yet. Interestingly, in the non-human primate model, it has been shown they cannot be reinfected, and that's a good sign. That means a vaccine is probably viable. And the last one here are Syrian hamsters, which actually happens to be my favorite model, because it's a really neat little model. It was developed very quickly, shows aerosol transmission, and it's doable, we can do these very quickly. And this will be great for scanning a number of different targets. Similarly, sero serology, there wasn't any. How do you know a vaccine works? Well, what we had to do was collect serum from patients, and then we sent it to our friends at the National Institute of Biological Standards of, and Control here in the UK. They're pretty much the world leader in developing these standards. And then we were able to send this out to all our partners and people who weren't our partners as well, but wanted it, we will give it to them. 
And then that is the sort of the gold standard that your vaccine has to reach, whether that be endpoint ELISA or virus neutralization. We've even worked out how to do virus, uh, virus neutralizations using live virus, which we managed to procure and produce to GMP and again made available to the community. And also there are pseudovirus assays available as well. But now we have a definitive way in which we can compare it. It's not a race. We're not trying to say one's better than the other, but we just need to know it works. And our COVID-19 response, that was only part of it. As I say, we interacted with people like WHO and the leading epidemiologists, engaged our active platforms. And also we had to really get these um, vaccines up and running. And as I say, we have about 10 running at the moment. So far, we've spent about half a billion dollars. I can tell you there's an announcement coming out in the next couple of days and that figure is about to double. Um, we really focused on rapid scale up and development. The world has about 7.8 billion people in it. How are we going to make enough vaccine for them now? So we are gonna require multiple vaccines, we're gonna require multiple sites, and we're gonna require multiple partners. Part of this was the ACT Accelerator, the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, which we were one of the principal players in, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, most of our projects will have at least a phase one by the end of this year, most will be phase two, and certainly by Q1 of next year, almost all of them will be in phase three. The ACT Accelerator is extremely important to us. This was set up in collaboration with our friends at Gavi, and you may or may not know it as their global pledging day today at the moment. In fact, it's going on as we speak. And the WHO. So WHO will coordinate this. CEPI, we will coordinate development of vaccines and manufacture. And Gavi will work out how to procure these and sell them to people that need it, regardless of the ability to pay. What we don't want are vaccines just going to the richest company or countries because they can afford it. That's not right. So the ACT Accelerate, the idea is that we will procure vaccine that will go into the ACT Accelerator. And then as an independent body, they will decide who gets it first. Obviously, everybody will get it eventually, but we need to um, prioritize people like the vulnerable and healthcare workers. They should get it first, regardless of where they are, not just because they can afford to pay. And you can see this was President Sarkozy who was involved in starting it and many, many world leaders were involved in this. So it's, it's a really great initiative. And hopefully if today's pledging event with Gavi goes well, that will also increase the funds available to spread um, vaccine around the world. Our vaccine portfolio itself, as I say, we focus particularly on platforms that could be made rapidly, but also which could be scaled up. Again, agnostic on technology, that's irrelevant. We just need something that works. But engagement with multinationals is vital. If we want to make this, we need the big companies to help us manufacture it quickly. Now, the portfolio slide I showed you earlier on, this is how it's changed. And it's changed quite dramatically. You can see we've got, what, nine, in fact, there's actually 10 different COVID projects running at the moment. And we also, all of those disease acts at the bottom have been moved over to COVID as well. So we've got things like uh, recombinant proteins, inactivated viruses, RNA, DNA, recombinant viruses, you name it, we're trying it. Who cares what it is, we just want it to work. Another really important thing is sustainable manufacturing. We have to make sure these things can be made at scale, and so we have to work out, not only can they be scaled up, but can they be scaled out? And what that means is, can it be made in several different countries at the same time? So CEPI will also fund manufacture in the developing world, as well as in the, um, in the uh, New York countries as well. So we, we, we really need worldwide capacity. And that also includes things like fill finish. And for fill finish, that would mean like, are there enough glass vials in the world to make nearly 8 billion doses of vaccine? 
Probably not. So we've had to look at different technologies that can do that as well. So in summary, we were set up to respond to epidemic threats. Well, we've got one. We moved as rapidly as we can, and we've been seeking out partners worldwide to assist us with this. There's no monopoly on brains. The C in CEPI stands for coalition. We work with people, not against them. We will try and produce billions of doses as quickly as we possibly can, but also, importantly, as safely as we possibly can. Everything will be tested properly before it goes into humans. Cutting corners will not help anyone. And just to finish, initial animal data certainly suggests that it should be possible to do this. So if all goes according to plan, I hope to come back someday and tell you how we did it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Whelan. That was great. Um, again, it's a tremendous portfolio under CEPI uh, in a broad way to really try to tackle this uh, pandemic at the vaccine level. So I have several questions. Thanks, everyone, for chatting in the chat box your questions. We see them there, and we'll try to loop, loop back to those. Uh, but before we dive into that, uh, I'd like to welcome our next speaker. So it seems that uh, Professor Jean-Marie Kayembe from uh, DRC is unfortunately uh, called away to a meeting with the president of uh, DRC uh, related to COVID-19. So I, I, I wanna, while that is sad for us, it, it is a great thing I think for DRC and for us as our community of practice to know that some of the speakers that we have, like uh, Professor Kayembe and our next speaker, uh, Professor Rhoda, Wayenze are leaders in their countries in the COVID-19 response, right? So these are your peers and the people to look up to and to talk to for advice and, and uh, perspectives on how to have fantastic careers in public health and one health. So unfortunately, uh, Professor Kayembe won't be joining us. So let's turn now to Professor Rhoda Kayenze, who can give us her perspectives on the great work that they're doing there in Uganda. Please, Dr. Rhoda. Thank you um, for the opportunity to participate in this. I will get to share the slides shortly, sorry. Um, okay, so um, uh, I have just about five slides uh, to share with you in terms of what we are doing uh, in Uganda. And um, I'll start with uh, just a snapshot of where we are in Africa. I think we've seen some of this for, from Brian, so I'll just go through uh, this very quickly. Um, in this slide, uh, basically what I wanted to share is that uh, despite uh, the comments around uh, that seemed, uh, initially seemed to indicate that um, COVID will not be a big problem in Africa. We see that the numbers are growing and every week, uh, based on these figures from the Africa CDC, we see that the numbers are rapidly increasing. And uh, I just need to note that these numbers are increasing at a time when many countries are still in lockdown. So we don't exactly know what this would look like um, if the countries in Africa had not responded very quickly with the lockdown. So of course we have challenges with the lockdown and, and we've been discussing a lot of these um, uh, in number of, uh, of forum in terms of the negative socioeconomic impacts as well as the effect on non-COVID care. But we need to note that these numbers are growing despite the widespread lockdowns that we still have in Africa. And uh, I included this slide also from CDC Africa just to show the status as of uh, end of May in terms of the restrictions related to COVID-19 in Africa. And we see that the majority of countries are still um, holding on to very severe restrictions, including our full border closures, um, uh, restrictions to international traffic, as well as uh, uh, various forms of restrictions across the borders uh, to entry as well as exit across a number of countries. Now I'll turn over to the situation in Uganda. Rhoda, and can we get it in presentation mode? 
just to make the slide a little bigger, could you just put it in? Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't realize it was still in there. So um, this slide shows where we are in Uganda and summarizes the story in terms of uh, when we first uh, identified COVID-19 cases in Uganda, the first case was confirmed on 21st of March. And um, a day before then, we actually had uh, several reactions um, and actions from in Uganda, including closures of schools. So that happened uh, before the first case was, was closed because of what we observed around a number of countries. And we were hoping that we, we would manage uh, to, to be able to stop um, entry into Uganda, especially because of the aggressive screening that was happening at the airport. Um, which in a way also helped us because we were able to pick up the first cases um, on um, a, a flight, uh, Emirates flight that was coming in. And uh, since then, we were able to follow through most of the contacts of the initial cases and we are also able to track flights uh, that came in uh, from various countries, uh, from Europe, uh, as well as uh, especially from Dubai, where we, were, we got most of the cases. So we were able to track uh, uh, over 90% of the contacts of the individuals that came in at that time, and they were quarantined uh, and tested. So the initial cases that you see on the left side around March were all uh, related to the travelers that came in on those flights and their contacts. And uh, then we had a, a bit of uh, uh, reduction in cases until around uh, early May, when we started uh, seeing again a lot of cases coming in. And these were largely uh, from truck drivers from neighboring countries. Initially, most of these were coming in from uh, the Kenyan border. And, and, and later on, uh, we saw these coming in also from the Tanzanian uh, border. And uh, the numbers have grown. Now most of the cases that we see are coming in across the border with, with Sudan. And um, more than 80% of the cases that we've registered today, uh, which have now increased to 522, uh, either from truck drivers uh, directly um, uh, coming in across the borders or their immediate contacts. So as you can see from this slide, uh, most of our issues are actually arising from the cross-border uh, travel because our border remains open to cargo uh, through road, uh, especially uh, which is brought in by the truck drivers. Uh, this slide also shows a number of other interventions that were instituted by Uganda, uh, including the, the uh, countrywide lockdown with a curfew uh, starting at 7 uh, p.m., the mandatory testing for the truck drivers, and then um, eventually beginning the lockdown, uh, which I'll speak to a short while. Um, we also started a rapid assessment survey. This was a community-based survey, especially targeting several populations uh, across the border districts, the highway districts, as well as other congregate populations that we thought were at high risk of COVID. At this point, what we wanted to establish was whether we were missing community transmission uh, in Uganda uh, uh, by focusing largely on the travelers. So um, this is a summary of the mitigation measures that we've implemented uh, in Uganda. The countrywide lockdown has been on, uh, on since about two months ago. And uh, this was mainly started to provide an opportunity for us to rapidly expand the capacity to be able to mitigate the epidemic, but also to quickly prepare the care system to be able to provide care. So during this period, we, we had a, a fairly extensive checklist of the activities that we wanted to implement, including expanding the surveillance, uh, the testing capacity, which was at that time only in one uh, center and has now since expanded to various uh, centers with uh, gene expert machines. We also did training as well as guidelines for case management and we're able to quickly track and isolate um, individuals who are infected and also quarantine those that were exposed during this time. So uh, in addition to this, we also developed a checklist for um, what would be the triggers for us to comfortably 
uh, lift the lockdowns, including the capacity that we wanted to have in place for care, as well as capacity for surveillance, and also uh, being able to track and, and, uh, and, and manage uh, uh, the cases that had come in, but especially also to ensure that we didn't have widespread community transmission at the time. So we did a, a review of this and the lockdown actually started at the time when we had covered close to 20,000 uh, of the respondents in the community survey. And uh, at that point, we, we didn't have evidence of uh, uh, community transmission, uh, apart from a few sporadic cases, um, uh, initially about four of them. And then uh, at this point, we also looked at the issues of continuity of non-COVID care because we were experiencing quite uh, a number of uh, challenges and, and reports around interruption of certain services. So this guidance was also developed around this time to ensure that we also maintain essential uh, care. And then we started with a phased uh, opening, which is currently ongoing. Uh, and, and today we had a wider opening of public transport for the first time after almost two months uh, of, uh, of freezing the public transport. The other measures that we are implementing are the physical distancing. Uh, we uh, are recommending at least two meters for now, although we've seen uh, evidence coming in about uh, uh, the, the study that uh, Brian just shared. Uh, that, that this could be maybe about one, one meter, but we are going to look at that a bit more carefully. We have also recommended masks, um, and, uh, and, and people are beginning to use this. Uh, masks are not uh, a commonly used uh, uh, measure for us in Africa, so it's going to take a while for people to adapt them. So we decided that we are going to start a bit early, although we don't yet have evidence of widespread community transmission, we thought by the time we transition to this phase, then we will have gotten the communities to adjust to using masks. And then we are also encouraging hygiene, uh, hand hygiene, cough uh, hygiene and etiquette, as well as other forms of environmental hygiene. We are not doing uh, aggre as aggressively the shielding of the elderly. This is something that, and, and those with underlying conditions, this is an area that we are struggling with also in terms of appreciating how do we actually institute a shielding of the elderly given the way we live with them uh, within our households. And uh, while the young people keep moving around and still continue to interact with the elderly, and some of the home settings actually may not even allow a shielding within the household. So this is an area that we think we need to study more in terms of how it can work uh, for Uganda and for Africa. So what have we succeeded in achieving uh, as Uganda within the current phase? Um, we, we believe we have done well with our contact tracing, the quarantine and isolation, especially of the initial cases that came in uh, via air travel. And because of this, we were able to interrupt the community transmission that could have uh, happened at the time. And the cases actually did reduce. Uh, and, and on several days, we didn't have any of these until we started getting um, a heavy traffic coming in through the borders, uh, through the truck drivers. And um, so right now, the biggest challenge we have is how to deal with uh, uh, cross-border travel and, and infections among truck drivers and their contacts. And this is growing across a number of the entry points. We have also been able to expand uh, the capacity for surveillance, uh, case management, and, and also are working on uh, increasing the manufacture of um, supplies, including masks. Now we have uh, some companies locally that are able to provide, uh, to produce masks. The numbers are still small, but growing, and also have a number of ongoing uh, studies and innovations, including uh, uh, test kits, rapid test kits that are currently in the pipeline. We have also had a very good engagement with the private sector, uh, including um, the very aggressive risk communications uh, uh, with the telephone companies and, and many others that are involved in uh, social behavior change communication. And uh, we have the guidelines in place uh, to support care. And we hope that we can maintain good care. So far, we don't have any fatality, but the numbers are growing. So we are concerned uh, about the need to quickly expand the care and also sus sustain good care for those that are infected. Um, in terms of the challenges, um, the testing uh, capacity is still grossly limited. 
uh, that is a challenge across Africa, as you can see from this map uh, that I picked from the CDC Africa. We don't yet have widespread testing. And yet, if we are to transition to localized uh, interventions and restrictions, we need to know where the new infections are coming from. So this is a big challenge for us in terms of mapping uh, interventions and having localized interventions as we move away from the widespread uh, lockdowns. We also need to expand our surveillance and the early case detection and management, especially as we lift the lockdowns. We are now looking into opening up the schools, for example. We've opened up the work environment, including uh, informal sector settings, such as markets, which are quite crowded. So we need to work out mechanisms for surveillance and early case reporting and detection. We have... Um, uh, worked with the issues of uh, social distancing, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, but we notice increasingly that these are very difficult to implement, especially in the crowded peri-urban uh, settings uh, in the slums, as well as informal work settings, and, and, and this is an ongoing challenge that we are working on through uh, risk communication, but also realizing that it's very difficult uh, to, to achieve distancing, for example, in very small you know, uh, house, uh, houses uh, if one had symptoms. The scale up of uh, um, training for health workers is also an ongoing area that we are working on to improve the case management, but especially also the infection control and prevention so that we can protect our healthcare workers. Shielding of the elderly, I've mentioned that, and also shielding those with other underlying conditions. That is work in progress for us in terms of exploring how we can best do this within our setting. And then certainly we continue to have challenges with the cross-border uh, response. We've had engagements with uh, countries uh, within the East African region uh, to try and strengthen this, but it certainly remains a challenge because our biggest uh, number of uh, uh, case load is now arising from the Ugandan uh, truck drivers that are exiting and returning uh, to Uganda. So this is the summary. Um, I'm happy to discuss any emerging uh, questions and, and comments as we go along. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Prof. Uh, Wayenzi. That's great. Thank you for the, the perspective on Uganda and how the situation is there and how it's evolving uh, well, as we speak, as it is in all of our countries, right? So, well, let's, let's turn to the questions. Um, so there are quite a few that have come in and thank you for those. It's uh, lovely to hear uh, your voices through the chat, but let's try hearing your actual voices. Um, so I think uh, <clears throat> we'll turn first, if you don't mind, uh, Irene, I'm gonna to turn to you. So if I could welcome a question from Irene Nagaga from Afrohun Secretariat. I thought your question was quite quite good there about uh, uh, vaccine choice. If you wanna ask your question and we'll start the question to Dr. Whelan and then we'll uh, go ahead from there. So Irene, please. Yes, thank you and thank you to our presenters. My question was on what we are hearing in the news and in literature about possibilities of mutation of the virus. So, uh, and yet we are here focusing on the vaccine. So my question was, should we be looking at vaccines for long-term solutions? Uh, and maybe Mike can comment on even the plan to choose a single vaccine or a cocktail of vaccines. Thank you. There are a couple of excellent questions there, actually. Um, in terms of mutation of the virus, it actually, although there's a couple of differences in, in the uh, literature, the actual spike protein doesn't seem to vary very much. There was a paper in, from Scripps last week, which is the only one which has a theoretical difference. Actually, so far, nobody's seen that it makes any difference at all. Also, most of the, vi the vaccines tend to be based on the spike protein rather than the nuclear protein. So they all tend to be using the same region. So variation hasn't been a huge issue. And Maria van Kerkova from the WHO recently said she didn't think there was two strains. But you're right, there are, there are variations in the RNA sequence, but they actually don't seem to make that much difference to the particular target. Going on to your other question about 
cocktail of vaccines and so forth. The, the real issue is scalability. We can't give everybody three vaccines. They can only get one because there's not going to be enough for the world. If we imagine, say, making, we were doing some sums last night. There's one particular vaccine. To make three million, or 300 million doses of it, we need 120 runs of a 2,000 litre fermenter. So we can't give everybody that plus another two. They'll get one and then we'll have to work from there. So it's going to be a scalability issue. So I don't think there's going to be one size fits all. It's going to be a number of different things, but some great questions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Irene, for that question. And thank you, Mike, for the, for the response there. The, yeah, the, the logistical challenges of this, I, I think hardly any of us can grasp how the magnitude of this issue and what's required. Uh, syringes, needles, glass vials, as Mike was talking about, to finish vaccine into the pretty vials that you see on the pharmacy shelf. Uh, and do you even need those pretty vials? Maybe we have to get solutions where we just drop those uh, for this particular issue. So uh, I'd like to turn now to a question for uh, uh, Professor uh, Boyenze. And uh, this one will just come from me because I, I, I thought it was quite timely where if, if we do have vaccines available, so let's say the Dr. Whelan's project at CEPI is fantastically successful and there are now 10 fantastic vaccines that were safe and effective and hit all the right marks. In, in Uganda, uh, how would you see the distribution of those vaccines? Because that's another important thing. It's, it's one issue to make the vaccines. You have the pretty vials on the shelf, but then how do you get those out to the people? And then how would you go about picking where to start? Like, who would you start with? How would you distribute it? Because uh, someone will be first, and then someone will have to be last. Uh, so how would you go about that? So, uh, Prof. Rhoda, please, your perspective on that. Okay, uh, thank you, Brian. Um, so we, we have been, uh, um, uh, we have developed a research agenda uh, for, um, for the COVID response. And uh, one of the areas we are looking at is the vaccine preparedness. Um, and, and we have um, uh, several colleagues from the Uganda Virus Research Institute um, that, that are working on uh, uh, vaccine preparedness uh, work, including uh, uh, reviewing uh, mechanisms for participating in clinical trials, if we have to do that for, for the vaccines under development, but also looking into how we can be able to do the distribution. This would be through the expanded program for immunization that has done uh, quite well for the uh, immunization for, for children and um, is quite capable of uh, uh, quickly integrating any emerging uh, vaccines that we would work on uh, jointly with the National uh, Public, Inst uh, Public Health Institute um, and, and the, the Emergency Operations Center uh, that is responsible for the COVID response. In terms of the prioritization, uh, we do uh, have a mapping of various um, uh, vulner vulnerable populations and uh, those that are at high risk. Um, right now, uh, for example, we do have healthcare workers uh, and, and we know from statistics across the world that they are very uh, at very high risk uh, because of interacting with uh, COVID patients, uh, including those that are within the non-COVID care setting. And then we do have, for example, the border districts where we have uh, right now the highest risk uh, of uh, 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 moving to community transmission, uh, where we have a lot of cross-border movement for trackers as well as informal uh, cross-border uh, settings. Populations. Um, uh, especially the, the, the peri urban poor and others, where some of the non pharmaceutical interventions might not be as easy to implement. So, we do have um, uh, right now an ongoing discussion also around um, how we can be able to quickly uh, integrate this, but that is still work in progress. Thank you. Mm. Th thank you for that perspective. Um, so, yeah, so if, I, if I may, yeah, actually, sure. Brian, yeah. this also, the ACT Accelerator um, also kicks in here as well. This is part of, of our issue that everybody in the world is going to need these, and we are going to have to make prioritizations, 
not just in developing countries, but worldwide. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be enough vaccine for everybody at first. So we are going to have to have, we would prefer to have it this independent third party, the ACT Accelerator, where they will say, healthcare workers, we don't care if you're in New York, if you're in Dubai, or if you're in South Africa, it really makes no difference. If they need it, they get it. And that's that, that we think is the only fair way to do this. Over. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Yeah, uh, this is a real challenge. Uh, we have some paradigms, I think, from work that several of us have done in the Ebola context and how to roll out vaccines for a high consequence disease uh in a rational way healthcare workers other you know contact tracing and contacts and things and sort of a ring vaccination approach uh, which is extremely effective in the ebola context uh i think for the covid19 and i'm going to come to a question about this in a second that that's quite a challenge in that so many of us are infected but appear to be asymptomatic or so so mildly symptomatic that we don't really even recognize that we're sick. Uh, so the mm -hmm. contact trace ring vaccination is very difficult uh, in that context for this. So uh, there's a nice question around that. Uh, there's two questions in a row here that I see. And I want to ask if Millie Natimba could ask her question about herd immunity, if she can. And if you can't connect, then I'll, I'll just read it and uh, set it up, uh, the question. Thank you, Brian. Uh, mine is around herd immunity. And uh, I'm wondering what percentage of the population should get infected before country actually obtains herd immunity. And uh, whether the benefits of herd immunity are worth the, the lives that get lost along the way. Thanks for the question. Who would like to respond? Mike? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I think the data is out there that says it actually needs to be quite a large percentage. It's well over 60%. We do, we do not believe that it's possible without a vaccine. Most herd immunity doesn't really exist. Things like measles is actually about 95% in order to, because it's so infectious. The real issue is the, infect, the attack rates in the societies are perhaps not as high as people think they are. But look what happened in Sweden. Sweden did not have a lockdown. And actually, per capita, they've got one of the highest death rates in the world. So we believe the only way to get out of this is with a vaccine. Yes, there is herd immunity out there to a certain extent, but it's not going to be enough to stop the spread of the virus. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, then another question, uh, just in that uh, vein. Uh, from Anne Landeswaal, would you like to ask uh, your question uh, um, uh, along the lines of herd immunity, but more about duration of immunity? Anne? Yeah, hi everybody. So yeah, I was just wondering uh, if we had any idea of the half time of you know, COVID antibodies, how it protected people, if it prevented reinfection, and uh, if it was linked to age or initial infectious dose? This, this is a fantastic question <laughs> and almost impossible to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly um, with other coronaviruses, and I'm thinking particularly about SARS-1 and MERS, the, whether you get lifelong immunity is not uncertain at the moment, and it may well require a booster we just simply don't know what we do know from the animal models is that we do get protective immunity particularly in non-human primates that it doesn't seem to be possible to reinfect them and we do get what looks like a correlative protection in humans with virus neutralization and virus levels so it looks like there's a correlation in there is that the only mechanism probably not we know there is a very active T cell response in there, and whether if you hit it hard enough, whether a T cell response alone might be enough could well be true. So I think there's no one answer to this. It's probably a combination of both, that you will have neutralizing antibody and you'll probably have T cell as well. But if it's anything like the other coronaviruses, you may well need a booster to generate memory. But I, a lot of this is inference based on the animal data that we have so far. Thanks for that. Uh, so now I have a question uh, to turn to uh, uh, Prof. Wayenzi, and it's 
a sort of a two-part question. I'll just, I'm gonna combine a few of the questions uh, just to put them together for you. Uh, so there's a question, our, our comments here about our more broad perspective on One Health and public health, which is uh, the promotion of healthy diets and things to help people be prepared physically if they were to get sick. And if you could talk a little bit about how in Uganda, uh, you in general promote uh, wellness, just general concepts of public health wellness. But then also uh, it's interesting, you talk about the imported cases that have come into Uganda, and now many of those are from the truck drivers that are crossing the borders, uh, uh, no, you know, uh, I guess, east into Kenya and then from the south from Tanzania. Uh, if you could talk about, has anyone looked at the ways those truck drivers are getting infected and is there any insights there? So, uh, Prof. Rhoda, please. Um, thank you, uh, Brian. So, um, yes, in terms of the, the risk communication, uh, one of the areas that we are talking about is actually the wellness, the diet, the, you know, in, you know the, the usual wellness um, uh, uh, mechanisms to ensure that we, we are healthy and that we are able to, to fight off disease uh, as we know it. So that's part of the, the risk communication that, uh, that we are actually uh, are doing. Um, and of the uh, imported cases, um, we we are right now working on um, a study uh, to try and characterize uh, the risks uh, around the truck drivers, uh, with the intention of uh, also building this within the risk communication and ensuring that even when they cross the borders, that they are able to protect themselves and and uh, they don't get infected. So that is um, uh, work that that is uh, ongoing uh, to to try and and improve that uh, in addition to other measures um, at ensuring that they are frequently tested and, and supported so that we can build also uh, a cohort of negative uh, drivers and, and those that fully understand how they can protect themselves uh, even when they are able to cross. Because one of the challenges we have is that we can't completely stop the cross-border uh, travel since we are a landlocked country and we depend on that uh, to be able to get um, essential supplies, including medical supplies. Yeah, so that is ongoing. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now let's turn to Marie Benoit, I believe, uh, and your question. If you'd like to ask your question, and if you can't connect, then I'll read it uh, out, out loud to the group. Uh, Marie, can you ask your question? Hi, yes. Um, I hope you can hear me. My question was uh, regarding vaccine hesitancy and what are some ways that uh, we can address that once a vaccine is released? Yeah, thank you for that. It's a critical question. Uh, let's, let's start with uh, Dr. Whelan, and then we'll hear uh, Prof. Rhoda's uh, 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 perspectives on that. Yeah, so. the, this is a fabulous question. And the way we tend to address it is that we can't make mistakes. Mistakes mm -hmm. were made, particularly in the dengue vaccine release in Malaysia. We can't do that. So. We need to be sure there are no safety signals whatsoever. That's not going to get make vaccine hesitancy go away, but we cannot have another episode like we had with dengue, denvaxia. So in particular, what we're concerned about is the possibility, and it is quite a remote possibility, that you could get immunopathology, that if you had antibodies to it, you would actually get this enhanced disease when you actually get it. And it was seen with SARS-1 in vitro and in model systems, but it was seen. So we need to be sure everything will go through that system and make sure there is absolutely nothing there. And that's why we have so many different animal models working throughout the world. It's a partial answer. There's a lot more to it, and there's a political element to this and making sure that people fully understand what we're doing. But it's a very difficult question, but I think for number one for us is no shortcuts for safety and no shortcuts for regulatory. Yeah, th thanks, Mike. And uh, Prof. Um, Wendy, yeah, your perspective. 
Yeah, certainly the safety is key because when we have uh, any safety concerns, it makes it very difficult to communicate uh, with the communities. And we already hear uh, quite uh, a lot of concerns on social media about the emerging vaccines, including participation in trials, let alone uh, uh, being among the first to receive the vaccines. Uh, we, we see a lot of uh, negative communication around this already. So um, uh, making sure that these are safe and we don't get uh, reports of, of uh, unintended consequences would be very helpful. But also certainly we need to deal with the already existing concerns around vaccines and uh, sometimes fears around the intentions uh, 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 in, in using these vaccines. So we have to integrate that within the risk communication and, and get it well um, as, as we get started. Yeah, thank you. I, I, to me, I think this is the central challenge of vaccinations. Uh, it, while making the vaccine is hard, scientifically, technically, it's tremendously complicated. And I have learned a lot working with uh, a Mike from CEPI with some of our Rift Valley Fever projects. Uh, actually getting people to want to take the vaccine and feeling that it is safe and will protect them is, I think, much harder to, to solve. Uh, a much diff more difficult social uh, education issue that we all need to be thinking about and working on, especially those of us that work in risk communication and uh, public health outreach type uh, type work. It's absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to ask, uh, actually, since uh, our, our colleague from DRC uh, wasn't able to join, I, I think maybe it was just take a few moments if we could have perhaps Sam Wanjohi who's the uh, country manager for Afrohoon in Kenya, talk about some issue that you think is important uh, that we've discussed already from the Kenyan perspective and see if there's any differences or things we could learn there. Uh, Sam, if you, could, if you could speak for just a few minutes, we don't have a lot of time, but I'd appreciate that. And let's just hear, hear from you. All right, great, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Uh, my dean, Prof. Mabel is, is online, so probably uh, she could go first and uh, say hi then probably can give uh, a few sentences, if that is okay. Uh, sure, of course. For... Prof. Mabel? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Sam. All right, great, thanks. Uh, probably I just wish to, to uh, share or mention, because I can't, I can't quite share my screen, I just wanted to mention that uh, since since the first case uh, was detected in Kenya in uh, March March 13th, I think we currently now have, as at yesterday, uh, 2,093 cases as at 2nd June uh, 2020. Uh, we've had so far uh, several uh, counties. Out of 47, we have 35 counties which are currently now uh, reporting uh, cases, uh, and we have a case fatality of 3.4%. As at yesterday, uh, yes, as of yesterday, second second June, uh, 2020. So, 35 of the 47 counties that we have in Kenya are currently reporting cases. Uh, one of the things that has been mentioned is is the issue of the truck drivers that has come up, and we yes, I agree, we have the cross border challenges that we are currently experiencing. So, what what uh, the government of Kenya has done is that uh, they've introduced uh, targeted uh, testing. Uh, targeted testing for truck drivers, and we've also introduced uh, the country has also introduced mass testing uh, because we have it, it is it has been established that uh, the virus is firmly within the community. So we are currently in a community transmission stage. So probably that could speak to the question that you just asked about where the truck drivers are being, uh, or rather how the the transmission is happening with the truck drivers or where they're getting infected from. So they're probably getting infected from the from the communities uh, com community transmission stage. So for this particular element, uh, protocols have been introduced, testing protocols have been introduced and uh, for truck drivers, where they are expected to undertake uh, COVID-19 tests 48 hours before the start of their journeys and uh, mm -hmm. will only be allowed and are only allowed to travel once they are uh, given a COVID-19 free certificate uh, issued to them. So that is uh, one of the measures or interventions that the country has, has done to try and stem this uh, tide of infections within the truck drivers. 
So it, uh, we, we're also having uh, uh, cross-border collaborations between uh, the, border, the, the border communities uh, with Uganda and with, with uh, Tanzania to try and see how uh, this element of uh, truck drivers, the infections of the truck drivers uh, are getting are going to be you know, curtailed or mitigated against uh, either from Uganda to Kenya or Kenya to Uganda or Kenya to Tanzania or Tanzania to Kenya and uh, vice versa. So basically, one of the measures that has been implemented is the introduction of the testing protocols. Uh, truck driver is only allowed to travel uh, with a COVID-19 uh, test, you know, being done 48 hours and being given issued with a uh, COVID-19 free certificate. So uh, briefly, Brian, that is what, what I would wish to, to comment uh, wow. on that issue. Uh, th thanks, Sam. That was great. I appreciate that very much. Uh, you know, one of the lessons I think uh, from tracking this uh, virus around the world, if you remember earlier in some of our sessions, I referenced you to nextstrain.org, which looks at the sequence of the virus, and you can see how the virus has moved around the world, probably by airplanes in the beginning, but now we're definitely seeing the signal from a, a more local movement of people in trucks and buses and such. Um, so check that out, and I, it's interesting. I think we're all in a in a surge stage now where we're going to need to increase diagnostic testing so that we can keep track of who is infected and hopefully isolate those people to break these chains of transmission. But uh, thank you everyone for your comments. It's really wonderful. I, I really appreciate everyone joining and, and, and uh, contributing. Uh, but this will be the end of the Q&A session. I uh, just personally want to thank the speakers for their insights and the people for asking their questions. And I'll turn it back to uh, Dr. Mazet uh, to uh, uh, say some goodbyes and then on to Dean Vizeo. So Dr. Mazet, please. Yes, well, I just wanna thank uh, the colleagues from from Uganda, Prof and, and Seppi, Dr. Mike. I mean, it just, you really brought us rich content and I think we all have a, a debt of gratitude to pay to Seppi. So thank you for helping us get out of this situation and um, thank you, Prof, for, for really managing and um, being such a great leader for Uganda. So uh, we really appreciate all of that. I, I um, want to just express also my um, concerns for everyone uh, that is dealing with the anxiety and the, uh, the difficulties, economics and otherwise, that we sometimes um, don't speak about as much in the general public health kind of discussions, uh, and we need to. And um, for us in the United States, I think many are aware that we are um, living with the consequences of centuries of uh, racial inequities and the, um, the severe anxiety and situation that COVID has also caused has heightened everyone's um, just uh, personal situations and so we want to make sure that we um, make a statement that that all lives especially black lives matter and I want to make sure that we're um, leading with that as well at this very difficult time and with that I would love to turn it over um, to my partner Dean Bezeo for our final comments. Thank you Jonah and the I'd want to first thank Mike. I think you have opened our eyes. We have been, many people are talking about vaccine, vaccine, but now we can see the challenges that you people are going through. But later on, see the challenges that the vaccine will be here, but the use of that vaccine may not be as we expect. One, accessibility. To acceptability. These are big challenges. They do not, they, they may not be equal to the cost of developing this vaccine. So we need as professionals to start working on mostly the acceptability. Will people accept? Because with these investments, we must prepare our communities to be able to accept these vaccines. Thank you, Mike. I think your presentation. I wish it could be accelerated to hire or policy makers to start thinking about this. I want on the, in the same note, I want to thank our presenters, our other presenters, Rhoda, 
giving the experience of Uganda, uh, I think it was, it was good. And I think it opened some eyes of the people who are out there in other countries. How do we move? And I want to thank Sam that he has been following up this since we last heard from him. I think Kenya, you are making progress. And the, the, the decision by the government to have truck drivers tested for the eight hours before and been given certificates. I think that is great. If it can be done both in Tanzania and uh, our, our brothers in Sudan, I think this, is, this would be great. But also, not only truck drivers, because our borders don't have walls. So a truck driver may, may, may be coming here, <clears throat> but he's going through DRC to, 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 the, to Central African Republic. So we need to look at this closely. Lastly, I want to thank my co-host, Jonah, and her team for organizing this. And I look forward to yet another exciting discussion in two weeks' time. I want to thank Trina, although she hasn't said anything. I know she's behind all these things. Brian, thank you very much. And Bruce, we really love to know that you can make us share our experiences and learn a lot more. On this note, I want to say thank you and all of you. Bye-bye.